right. Good afternoon and welcome everybody to House Judiciary Committee. Uh, welcome back. It's good to good to see everybody. And uh, thank you, Peggy Delaney, who is helping us. Mike will not be with us uh, for this uh, our brief session, and uh, we'll be meeting Lori Moore shortly, who is staffing uh, another committee. And uh, so, really, want to thank the all of the staff for for pitching in. Um, usually not so busy and so really, really appreciate it. So we can, so we can do our work. Uh, so again, uh, thanks committee for your attendance at the uh, public hearings. I think that was definitely a, uh, a good start to our, our work. Um, certainly one piece of our ongoing work on um, racial and social justice. And I'll be filling you in um, more later today and then on Friday about our ongoing work with House Government Operations and Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, today we're gonna turn our attention back to S-234, which is the miscellaneous judiciary bill. We just have a few pieces of that bill to, uh, to revisit, which we'll start with. And, uh, and then uh, we have the technical fix. Uh, Michelle will be joining us and then we'll be uh, moving to, uh, to expungement of uh, criminal records for uh, cannabis convictions. So anyway. So Lori just joined us. Oh, great. Lori, great. do you wanna put your audio on real quick? I just, hi. <laughs> I Hello, just Lori. want to introduce you guys to Lori. So she's gonna be helping you guys and we're really appreciative as Maxine just said. Um, and Lori does house transportation and she's a superstar. Uh, so I think you guys are really lucky to have her filling in. And of course, I'll be there to help as well. Great. No well, pressure, thank Lori. Great, right, great. Right. Well, thank you, Lori, and, and welcome. Again, really appreciate uh, your help so far and, and moving forward. So, okay, great. So I'm going to get uh, started with S234, and we have um, Eric with us. Hi, Eric. Hi there. How are you? Good, thanks. Um, so we have new um, new language for section 34, which I believe is posted on our website, correct? No, right. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Great, and, um, and Eric, if you could give us a little bit of background. We, um, we did go over it, it was been quite a bit of time, uh, but this is one piece that I know you and Martin and others have been working on. And, and I'm also um, glad to say that um, committee after uh, Eric works with us on this. He will be uh, doing a walkthrough with Senate Judiciary because uh, they are taking up our our DLS bill, and uh, so I, I very much appreciate Senator Sears' um, interest in in uh, in the DLS bill as well as this, and and hoping to move those forward. So, anyway, okay, Eric, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. Nice to see you again. Uh, the, as uh, the chair was saying, we're talking uh, about a particular piece of S-234 right now. <clears throat> S-234 was the miscellaneous judiciary procedures bill. Remember a lengthy 30 page bill with all kinds of different moving parts. This one in particular deals with uh, persons who are uh, driving with suspended licenses. And I know the committee has worked on this issue, the DLS issue quite a bit over the years. It's a, a, a different approach to, but the same issue that's I'm sure very familiar to everybody, which is that, you know, a lot of times people's licenses are suspended for non-criminal reasons. In other words, it's not maybe an accumulation of points, speeding tickets, that kind of thing, rather than a DUI or a criminal offense that someone is charged with that also comes associated with a license suspension. So this other universe of people, folks who, whose licenses are, are suspended for non-criminal reasons, I think the committee has done a lot of work over the years trying to uh, find ways to get those uh, folks' licenses restored so that they can be back driving to work and doing other things that they need to do without driving illegally, which uh, I think the evidence the committee has heard sometimes does happen. So um, that's kind of the, the subject that the section uh, is approaching. And when S-234 came over from the Senate, there was a piece in there. It was called uh, an amnesty program for persons with suspended licenses. And what, what that um, section did was it took uh, uh, basically the, you know, there's two sets of fines slash fees that a person would have to pay uh, after their licenses, their license has been suspended. One would go to the court. So in other words, you, you've got your, your fine to the judicial bureau, whatever the fine was for the associated offense, whether it's for speeding or a previous DLS or going through a red light, whatever it is, there, there's a fine associated with it. <clears throat> so you've got fines, you know, the, the court, 
uh, as the as statutes have permitted them to do over the years. There are surcharges that go along with the, the fine as well. They'll go to various uh, court operations as well as the C Center for Crime Victim Services. All those surcharges are also added on to the ticket price. Uh, so you have that set of, of um, fees slash fines. And then there's also, once your if your license has been suspended, you also have to pay a reimbursement fee to the Department of Motor Vehicles. That's a separate, a separate thing that a person would owe if their license got suspended. So when 234 came over from the Senate, uh, the program that it had, this amnesty program, uh, required that both those sets of fees and fines be waived and that the person's license be reinstated if it was someone who, whose license had been suspended for a non-criminal reason for at least a year. So that was kind of the universe of people you were talking about. Someone whose license has been suspended for um, over a year for a non-criminal reason. If that was the case, then this amnesty program was established, waived all the, all the fines and fees with the court and DMV, and the person's license got reinstated. The, st the language also was sort of had a, a lengthy process for how that would happen. And the attorney general, if you may, you may recall, would get all the names together on a list and submit it to the judicial bureau, file a motion, et cetera, et cetera. So that was all, all the mechanism for how it would happen. But, but the big picture is, you know, who, who, who did, to whom did it apply and what fees got waived? So you may recall uh, back in probably, uh, I think it was June, May or June, that uh, you'll hear, hear there was testimony from the court that requiring all those fees to be waived um, would impose a substantial burden uh, revenue in terms of revenue for the court, as well as a lot of um, a lot of hours would be required to input all the data to do that. So the decision that the committee reached was, well, is there some, some other way we can go to maybe just waive the DMV portion of the fee? Remember the reimbursement fee that I just mentioned? Could we go that route? And uh, so that if someone were to uh, have paid all their, their court fees, uh, then they could get their license reinstated without having to pay that reimbursement fee to DMV. So that, in a nutshell, is what the new language in front of you does. Takes that, so you can see that it, 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 instead of having both sets of fees and fines waived, it only waives the DMV reimbursement fee fine, rec still requires the person to uh, comply with uh, other conditions that, that uh, one would ordinarily have to comply with, and that basically means your court fees. Um, but if they paid those and, and they, uh, uh, they're all set with those, then their reimbursement fee gets waived by DMV, and um, their license gets reinstated. So that's the big picture. We can take a moment to look at the language. It's, it's uh, uh, pretty straightforward, but I could pause there if anybody has any questions so far about the background or the, or the kind of overall description of what's, what's going on. I see Barbara's hand and then, and also after we hear from Barbara, uh, Martin, I know you worked on this quite a bit. So if you wanna add anything or, um, or respond to questions, please, please go ahead, but Barbara. Thanks. So Eric, this, I'm asking you because you may be able to jog my memory of if this was discussed or not, um, but two things sort of seemed um, troublesome to me. One is you said if people had um, had a suspended license for over one year, is that right? Not yes, so right. under a year, they still have to pay their fine. Yes, that's correct. But wouldn't it th be a disincentive for people to pay early then? Like, why not wait and get the discount? That's a good question. And I think uh, Willa will be able to talk a little bit about that okay. because, um, interesting, you know, I, I, she may recall, I asked her the same question <laughs> and, and she and I were, <laughs> were talking about it. Um, and the thought there is that, that um, there are some folks for whom you know, uh, you don't want your license to be suspended for any period of time. Sure. So, so I, I, you know, you're not gonna you're not gonna want to drive with a suspended license. So those folks um, will pay the fee within the year, and they can. because they can, and because they, um, for whatever reason, uh, are, don't have any incentive or don't have any any reason to want to drive with a suspended license. Whereas another group of people, and I think Willa can talk about this in more detail, the folks who, who don't pay within that year are frequently going to be the people who financially uh, you know, lack the means to do so. And therefore, they would be 
an appropriate group uh, to sort of uh, have the fee waived after a year. So in that sense, maybe the one year is, could operate as sort of a filter system as to the people that are genuinely have the financial need and those who could who have the means to pay the fee and start driving. But I think you're right, that, that issue is out there for sure. Well, especially for people that it's, I can pay my electric bill this month or I can pay my fine. So they may not, right, like, yeah. Anyway, I'll, I'll follow up with Willa. So my, you made a point early on, which was it came over from the Senate originally having both waived the right. judicial part and that it was too labor intensive for the judiciary, so it stayed in? Uh, no, I think that, and, and Judge Grierson, I think, would be able to talk about this a little bit more, but no, I, I think, and, uh, and on the committee's website, in fact, is a, is a memo that he had submitted to, to this effect, but I think that the two concerns the court were raising were, A, would take a couple thousand hours of, of work time to go into the system and find all these folks and delete the fines, and B, doing so would uh, cause a revenue issue for them. They would lose money by not collecting those fines. So for those two reasons, that piece of it is no longer in the bill that you're, the proposal that you're looking at now, that's right. So that the court fees uh, are still required to be paid and, and they're not waived as part of this uh, reinstatement program. Even with the wonderful new software that makes it easier to do like group expungement, et cetera? That's a good question for Judge Grierson. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I mean, it, it's just, I feel like, and again, this is more, I guess, a statement. There are times that we think something makes good sense as a policy, but the implementation of it is too burdensome for government. And so we end up keeping it in when our client, when it feels like we're here for the people, we want government to run well, obviously, but I just get concerned that sometimes we back off of things because of the uh, feedback we get from, from state agencies. Right, thank you. And I, I appreciate that and we'll hear the testimony and also I'm hopeful that, that maybe this is a first phase and that we could, we could get to those other folks at, an, at another time. Uh, thank you. Sure, so let's see, so I have Ken and then Tom. Hi, everybody. So um, <clears throat> if these fees were to go away, who's going to be uh, who's going to be responsible for the extra revenue revenue that's lost? The taxpayers, everybody going to cost more to live in Vermont is what I'm going out after. I think that's a, a you have a, a witness, uh, Dave Evans from the Department of Motor Vehicles, who's who looked at the proposal and how the how it would affect their revenue. So I, I'm not an expert in that, but I think he, he might be able to answer that question as to how they would absorb that or cover it. Okay, and then my next my next question I have on this is, is if somebody goes and, and, and uh, they lose it for any certain amount of time, why don't we give them like different, like if somebody loses loses it for a year or something, why don't we go and give them a year to, to uh, to pay it back so they've had a job and then they can pay us has that even been looked at i think uh, in, a, in a sense if i'm understanding your your question right representative goslin is that they don't me they only uh the fee only gets waived after they've been suspended for a year so they they would have had that year to pay it back if they could or so any, anybody who's who's been suspended, like let's say your license gets suspended three months ago, you can't, you don't qualify for the program. It has to have been suspended for at least a year. I I, I understand that. What I'm saying is, is somebody that loses their license, if it will go back to the year thing, then they have one year to pay it back. If they if they lose their license for three months and they've got let's say six months or something like that, has any of that been looked at? Uh, I don't think so. That's a good question. 
So Thank you. if I could just weigh in on just the, that issue as well, and kind of uh, goes back to Barbara's issue. It, it was it, the, the reason why we modified for or that I suggested that we modify this and we went forward with this with DMV and, and Willa, it isn't just because of hardship or difficulty for the court, but it has to do with incentives for paying the fines. And, and we learned in an earlier biennium, I think it was, uh, that there, there is a drop off of when fines are paid, but it's not within a year. It's within you know, some number of years be, uh, after that. So people are still paying their fines. And we also put into place uh, where an individual can uh, get on a payment plan. Uh, and, and if we said that, oh, after one year, everything's forgiven, uh, that, that payment plan uh, lane uh, would be a little less uh, interesting for individuals. So, so we tried to balance having incentives for people to continue to pay their fines uh, and also uh, with, with ensuring that you know, eventually somebody can get their, their license back. If they haven't gone back and paid their reinstatement fee uh, within that year, that means they, for whatever reason, <laughs> Yeah, and often it is just not being able to pay. I think it's $75 if I'm remembering right. Um, and let me just, just real quickly, and, and maybe Eric hit this and I was zoned out, but the, 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 the individuals who are subject to this, as I understand it, and we can double check with Willa, is a few years ago, we modified the license suspension laws. And we provided that if an individual uh, uh, got a, uh, or wasn't able or didn't pay their fee for a moving violation uh, that in, in the time they had to pay that, that fine, I won't say fee, they're fine. Uh, if they don't pay it within the 30 days of the due date, then their license would be suspended for 30 days and they could get that license back by paying the reinstatement fee without having paid the fines. So it's, it really is just that reinstatement fee that people haven't paid the fine and then they don't pay that reinstatement fee even though that's all that stands between them and getting their driver's license back. Uh, and, and that's the part that makes sense to me to get rid of. If, they, if it's been essentially nine months now that they haven't paid that reinstatement fee, let's just get them that driver's license back, make, make them still have to pay that fine uh, and, and do other avenues to try to get them to pay that fine, including perhaps they, they get the job eventually and they're able to pay that fine. So that's kind of the construct for, for why, you know, at least how, how I thought that this should go forward. I don't know if that clarifies anything or just raises a bunch of questions, but. Thank you. Uh, Ken, any other questions? No, okay. Tom. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I don't have a, a lot of problems, you know, with with this language. Uh, I think it's important. And I understand what Barbara was saying, but I think it's important that there is, you know, conditions and requirements. And uh, you know, going forward, if if we addressed, uh, you know, any more uh, um, uh, removing any conditions and requirements, I might have an issue. But but I do think it's important that people have skin in the game. I guess you could say, but. Um, but I, I just wanted to ask Eric, I, I know some of the reinstatement conditions are, you know, uh, court costs or things like that, but, but can you go through uh, just real quick, a, a list of what reinstatement conditions and requirements um, are in place now and would stay in place? Um, I, I think you already, you already covered it, but I, uh, I, I need to hear it again, so. <laughs> you're, you're muted, Eric. Thank you. Um, I hope I muted it in time so that you didn't hear the phone ringing. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> no, we uh, heard it. Oh, good. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding with you. <laughs> All right. Um, as far as the uh, conditions and requirements go, the, the only ones that I'm familiar with have to do with the the reimbursement fee to DMV and the uh, the court costs and the fine to the Judicial Bureau that would generally apply. Now I know that there's a couple of others, but I think. Dave Evans from DMV will be able to talk about that a little bit more, I think, and Willa from the court diversion program as well had taken a look at 
one of the model forms that DMV uses, which a lot of times when they send it to a person, it actually lists what some of the conditions are. I don't happen to have one of those, but I think they might yeah. be able to, to describe it for you in more detail if it covers things beyond the, the fines and fees themselves. Right, and, and thank you. Uh, I, I just needed to hear it again, ju just to remind myself that there is uh, a number of steps in, I, I guess with quotation marks around it, punishments, um, you know, that right. people do still have to go through. It's, it's not a, uh, you know, have your license suspended, uh, wait a year and get it back and, uh, you know, and, and have nothing happen, I guess you could say, and uh, no, nothing that might remind you uh, that you might not want to do it again. So, so anyway, right. thank you. No, I think that's right. That, that the idea is that you've done everything else and the own, and all the other requirements and the only thing left is that reimbursement fee. And, and if that's the thing that's, that's keeping you from being able to have the license, this permits DMV to just say, all right, if that's all you've got left, then we'll waive that. Can I just follow up with what Eric just said? Because I want to make sure I understand this right. That I thought that given those amendments that we did a few years ago, if it's a moving violation, uh, you have to pay your fine and, and the court costs. Uh, and if you don't, uh, then you lose your license for 30 days. And after those 30 days, all you have to do to get that license back is pay the reinstatement fee to DMV. That those fines, you don't have to, you no longer have to pay those fines and court fees to get your driver's license back. You've already essentially had the punishment for not paying or the incentive that they're trying to create for paying the fine is that you're gonna lose your driver's license for that 30 day period. But after that, they have to go after those fines and court costs in a different manner. And may, that's what I, because I want to make clear that I want to make sure that that's how it works. <laughs> yes, for, for, for that group of people, that is how it works. Yes, okay. there might, I think there might be others who don't qualify for the moving violation, you know, your, your whatever, your license might be suspended for some other non-criminal reason. Uh, but yes, I think for that universe of people, um, I want to say 2015 or 16, it was, initially, and this sort of is good background to have because there's another category of people covered by this in the language that I didn't yet mention. But initially, um, the way it worked was that for failure to pay, you're fine. You know, not for the underlying offense, not for the underlying moving violation or for whatever it was, but if you didn't pay your fine, your license would be suspended indefinitely, would be sp suspended permanently until you were to pay the fine. So uh, that was changed, I want to say, I don't know, 2012-ish in that ballpark. And they changed it to kind of goes where you're going, Representative Mar Lalonde, to six months. So, okay, it said, I think the initial period was six months, 180 days. Um, and for that period of time, if you didn't pay your fine, the only suspension that you would get for failure to pay the fine was six months. Then a couple of years ago, I think 2016, perhaps, and I probably have these dates all wrong, but it, I know that's been amended two times. That's when the 30 days was established. So then they said, okay, th what the legislature said was, we're gonna shorten that period up to 30 days. So if you're, th the period that your license would be suspended solely for not paying the fine, again, not associated with whatever the fine was for the underlying offense, for not paying the fine, you only get suspended for 30 days. And that's true after that 30 day period, if you, if you um, uh, haven't paid the fine that you owe to the Judicial Bureau, then you're eligible for reinstatement. You could, as long as you paid the reinstatement fee. Um, so what this does for would for that group of people, um, they would be uh, essentially um, not required to pay either one of the fines, either the criminal or the the moving violation fine or the reinstatement fee to the judicial to the DMV. Does that make sense? So one last little piece on that is that so the other thing that you'll see in the language of the bill, as I mentioned, the one group of folks to whom this applies is the ones who they're who, um, who at least a year ago had their license suspended for non criminal reasons. Um, and the other but the other group, though, is that as I was it was now that I look at the language, I remember it was 2014, that 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 indefinite um, suspension for payer to pay a fine 
went away. So <laughs> this also takes a group of people that says, all right, if your license was suspended before July 1st, 2014, which would have been, it would have been suspended permanently for failure to pay your fines, for that group of people as well, um, if you've satisfied all your other conditions, in other words, paid your court fines, et cetera, um, then you would be eligible for reinstatement. So if your license had been suspended indefinitely prior to July 1st, 2014, for a non-criminal reason, you'd also be within the group that can get um, get it reinstated without paying the, the fee. Thank you. Uh, Tom and Barbara, is your, is your hand up or is it, was it up from before? Okay, that's what, that's what I thought. Okay, Tom, go ahead. Great, thank you. Um, Eric, the, the scenario that, uh, the, the bill that we did that Martin brought up where it, uh, you would lose your license for 30 days, uh, you uh, pay the reinstatement fee and you get it back um, and, and you lost it because you didn't pay your fine. Now those fines are still owed, right? Uh, well, actually, uh, this will be a good question for Judge Grierson and DMV, but I think that the answer to that is no. That the, what, this, what the statute said, this language, statutory language was passed that said, after 30 days, um, if you haven't paid the fines that you owed, then, uh, oh, I'm sorry, um, I think the suspension for um, the, uh, the failure to pay goes away. But as to whether or not they'd still owe the court fees right. themselves, uh, I think those are still... Um, yeah. it, it doesn't bar them from getting their license back because right. this is, but but they would still owe them right they would still owe and uh, and not that it's that important but uh, do you remember if we or anybody discussed uh, um, on how the uh, court system goes about collecting that because uh, I'm sure they haven't put in any, in any new programs just for that. But I know uh, we've discussed in the past and tra tried to help them remedy a little bit um, how they do collect and, you know, and try to try to improve it. But so I don't know if there's a question in there. I'm just kind of reminiscing, I guess, about the past no, I think that I think that your question. witnesses do. Your witnesses will have some information on that. I, I've heard anecdotally that tax tax offsets, for example, are are now one of the biggest ways that that they're collected. But I, I think yeah. your witnesses uh, have, that same issue came up, and that's that'll be a good question to to direct to them too. Great, thank you. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. So, so Eric, if you quickly um, just walk us through through the language, that'd be great. Um, and then we can uh, hear from our witnesses that will help us uh, with the- uh, Sure. More, yeah, I more. think we've already gone over the, the top, the subject. So yeah. hopefully it'll just seem familiar when we look at the language, it's uh, pretty straightforward. So again, it's a, replacing the section 28 that was in S-234 as it passed the Senate with a new section 28 and no longer called an amnesty program, but it's a reinstatement fee waiver program. So you've got a different title for the program. And uh, it permits DMV to waive all license reinstatement fees for the group that I mentioned, for people whose licenses have been suspended under certain circumstances. Um, requires an, a, a, the date, and I should mention too about the language that uh, this has been um, reviewed uh, both by uh, Dave Evans at DMV and Will Farrell at the Court Diversion Project, and they were okay with it so far as is. Obviously, always can change, but the, they have seen it and thinks that it, that it would work. Um, so the, uh, the way it works is that by December 15th of this year, DMV waives all license reinstatement fees for any person whose license has, has been suspended for one of two reasons, and this is A and B, and this is what I was just mentioning. Who's the universe of people does it apply to? A, if your license has been suspended for non-criminal reasons for one year or longer, and you've satisfied all other reinstatement conditions and requirements, and that includes the payment of court fees, et cetera. So that's one group, uh, suspended for longer than a year for non-criminal reasons, and you paid all your other fees. B, it's this other group is the one I just mentioned. If you were suspended before July 1st, 2014, uh, again, solely for failure to pay the amount due, not for any other reason, but just because you didn't pay what was due. If that was the only reason for your permanent suspension, well, then you can, and you've satisfied all your other conditions, then you can also uh, have your reinstatement fee waived under this new language. So this authorizes DMV to do that. Uh, I should say requires them to do that. 
And then uh, not only do they waive the fees under subdivision two, they reinstate each person's license who's subject to that, uh, the criteria that I just outlined. And then under subdivision three, there's a notification provision. So they waive the fees, they reinstate the license, and then they notify each person that their license has been reinstated or that their license is ineligible for reinstatement and the reason for ineligibility. So if they've got some other criteria that they didn't meet, um, they would know. So they could go ahead and try and meet it if they wanted to. Um, and then uh, it just uh, ropes in an existing definition of amount due, which includes all the fees owed to Judicial Bureau, that sort of thing. Um, and that's pretty much it, P pretty straightforward. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Martin, your, your hand is going up and down, so I'm not sure. If yeah, I, did, I just had a question. There, there's one bit that is a little ambiguous to me, and, and that is the subsection B1A, the all other reinstatement conditions and requirements. What I had thought that meant was just the reinstatement fee or whatever money is owed to DMV, not any money owed to the court. But uh, let's hear from what DMV and Willa uh, understood that language to be. But I think we may need to clarify that because because that would suggest possibly that the fines and have to be paid as well and that was not the intent from what I understood and that was not the intent to have the court fees having to be paid either it was the intent I thought again to just have the whatever was owed to DMV to get the license reinstated but we should find out from Willa and, and Dave Evans what their understanding was as well so it's not yeah, necessarily you may, a question maybe one you may want to be more specific, but I think the way it's phrased is is consistent with what you're saying, Representative Long, because it's phrased that you waive it for any person who whose license has been under A, suspended for non-criminal reasons for one year, year or longer, and who has satisfied all other reinstatement conditions and requirements. And those other conditions and requirements, like the intent is anyway, is the court fees. So you have satisfied all the other ones other than the... Um, the reinstatement fee owed to DMV, um, then you'd be eligible. But maybe that needs more clarity. That, that does, because in fact, I thought it was if the, uh, because that would suggest that you paid your fines and your fees, and the only thing you haven't paid is the reinstatement fee. Right. And my understanding is what we were trying to go after was you have, you, you have everything outstanding. Uh, but the one thing you have to pay to get your driver's license back is the reinstatement fee. So, and I haven't seen this line. This is language you've worked on since, you know, we've, however many months it seems ago that we were last talked about this. Uh, but that was at least uh, what I thought we were in trying to do because what essentially, because that's, that's doing exactly what the, almost exactly what the Senate bill well, let me think about that. Well, so the Senate bill is saying we're going to waive those fines and fees and reinstatement fees, the court fines and fees and the reinstatement fees and give back the license. Correct. My response to that was, well, we shouldn't be waiving those uh, court fees and fines. We should just be waiving the reinstatement fee and they can get their driver's license back. Uh, that didn't mean, at least as I understood the proposal uh, that uh, they still, they couldn't get their license back until they paid those fees and fines, because that would be different than what we did a couple of years back, where we said, you lose your license for 30 days, and then all you have to do then is pay that reinstatement fee to get the, uh, the license back. You don't have to pay the fines and court fees, only the reinstatement fees. So that would be a step back, actually, from what we did a couple of years ago, unless it's only the reinstatement fee that they that they have to that is being waived. But we can uh, talk further with Will and Dave about that as well. Uh, right. And I can look back at whatever emails were kicking around back then. Right. So Eric, I didn't know if you wanted to respond or, or we can go right to our witnesses if. I didn't want to cut you off, Eric, if you... No, no. Uh, that wasn't my understanding of what the intent was. Um, okay, yeah. My, but that doesn't mean that I understood it correctly. My understanding, particularly based on Judge Grierson's memo, was that you did not want the people to have their licenses given back to them if they haven't paid their court fines yet, because that would mean that they were, they were essentially were never going to get them. 
Um, so, but I could be misunder misconstruing that. Right, and and then we'd have to look at whatever uh, it, the provision. I, I'm trying to remember or find the provision that we changed a couple of years ago. Again, what what that suggestion is would uh, reverse what we did a couple of years ago, and I don't think that was the intent. Okay. Well, again, those are good questions for our for our witnesses. Uh, any other questions for Eric? Can I just ask one question, which is, what is? Do you have the citation for uh, the provision that we changed a couple of years ago? I'm I'm trying to. Yeah, find it. I'm getting it. I'll send it to you. All right. Thanks. If you just put it in the chat, that'd be great. Okay. Great. All right, thank you, Eric. Um, and I know that sure. some folks are here for um, the next section of our agenda, and I'm sorry that we are running late, um, but uh, get to our witnesses and, and then move on. Okay, so we do have um, Dave Evans and Willa Farrell. Um, I'm wondering, how about Willa? Yeah, I was gonna ask you, welcome. Um, if you could start and you might be able to answer some of Martin's questions in terms of what we did before and, and help sort of give us context and, and groundwork. And that might be uh, helpful to then bring us up to where we are today. So, so welcome, nice to see you. Good to see everyone, good afternoon. Um, for the record, this is Willa Farrell with the Attorney General's Office and uh, Court Diversion and Pretrial Services. Um, for the big picture, my understanding of what um, Eric and I had discussed with Dave Evans was to uh, narrow the parameters of what this legislation would do such that when the DMV reinstatement fee is the only barrier to somebody getting their license, that that be waived. And so I think I'm no, um, I'm not a drafter of legislation, but maybe the comprehensive wording of all um, fees, maybe if it were just simply the DMV reinstatement fee might be more clear for people, um, but that was the intention to find, um, it's an $80 reinstatement fee for some individuals, that is the only reason they don't um, have a license. They, don't, they, they may not realize that's the only barrier or it is still a financial barrier to getting their license reinstated. The idea here then would be to, to waive that fee, the reinstatement fee, but the person would still be obligated to pay all of their fines that they owe to the Judicial Bureau and to address other reinstatement requirements. And so, for example, other reinstatement requirements might be that they obtain SR-22 insurance, which you, know, you were just referencing earlier. It could be that you have to complete IDRP, which used to be called Project Crash. It's an education program for alcohol-related violations. You may have out-of-state requirements that you need to address. Um, and Dave Evans certainly could explain those in more detail. But the idea here was for some people, the only barrier to getting their driver's license reinstated is that reinstatement fee. Um, so that was the intent of this proposal was to waive that. The idea of a one-year waiting period, I think, stemmed from the original um, bill passed by the Senate, and I don't know what the magic time period is. I think one wouldn't want that waiver to happen immediately, as a number of you have mentioned, in terms of you want to have an incentive for people to pay. I mean, most people who get a driver's a speeding ticket or some other violation that might lead um, to a suspension or to a 30-day, what is now a 30-day suspension pay. I mean, they don't want their license suspended. It's people whose lives are, you know, either really chaotic or they're struggling with poverty who may not, um, who may not be able to pay, frankly. And so they wait, they get suspended for 30 days, and then they're eligible to get their license back, but they have to pay that, that, that um, $80. So whether it's six months or a year, um, as I say, I'm not sure what the, that magic time period is, but um, I think Representative Rachelson brought this issue up to start with in um, Eric's testimony. But I think the idea that was to have some time period which would cap capture the most people who would satisfy their requirements and then pay the fee. But for some people, 
um, for whom that is the only barrier, if you wait a certain amount of time, then you could have a waiver. Um, I can, um, I'm just looking at my notes to see if there are other points I wanted to make. Um, um, there was a question about um, how the state collects the debt. There is a collections agency that the state uses called Alliance One or A1. And the Judicial Bureau sends um, the debt, I think it's 75 days after the debt was due and you don't pay, they then send that to a collections agency. And then every December they send um, what is owed by Vermont or, or anybody to the Vermont Tax Department. And then the Vermont Tax Department does what they call tax offsets to collect um, the debt. There's a whole sequence, as I understand, you know, of other debts that may be collected in that in that manner. Um, the other point I want to say, and I first I want to apologize to Eric about this because um, when he and I spoke, I think we discussed this, and then he then he sent me the language, and I I didn't click that there was another idea on the table that um, wasn't drafted, and I did email Representative Lalonde this idea, but back in May or June. So if I could just raise another proposal. Um, so this, this other idea would address the group of people who, whose lice, who are under suspension for failure to pay a ticket and that that occurred pre-July 1, 2014. So if you got a, a ticket before July 1, 2014 and you didn't pay it, your license was suspended indefinitely until you satisfied all your reinstatement requirements and paid that entire debt. Through the Civil DLS Diversion Program, um, we have there are people out there who owe thousands of dollars. This is the proverbial snowball problem that the committee has been addressing over the years where people get one ticket for something they, they get suspended, they keep driving to go to work or medical appointments, they get another ticket, et cetera. So there are individuals out there who still come to the diversion program who remain under suspension for tickets from before 2014 and who owe, a lot, who owe the state a lot of money and who through our program can create a, and through other programs are able to uh, do payment plans and make payments towards that, but until they satisfy that debt, they will not be able to be um, to get their driver's license. So the idea I wanted to suggest was that for people whose license, who are under suspension for failure to pay a ticket from before July 1, 2014, that their suspension be waived and that the requirement to pay the reinstatement fee be waived and they still owe the debt and they, they could avail themselves of the means created to pay that debt off over time, but that they would be eligible for reinstatement um, to, re, to obtain a valid driver's license and work. Currently, you can't do that unless you create, you get on um, a payment plan or are able to um, pay down your debt quickly. And, and not everybody knows of these options. But we, this, I mean, Vermont has already provided that opportunity for subsequent offenders that your suspension will be a short-term one of 30 days. So this, this idea in effect would be a, to um, provide that same reduced suspension time period to people whose suspension stems from before 2014. So I think I just may have gone around in circles a bit with that idea, um, but maybe it, I would end there to see if maybe if there are questions, I might be able to clarify that. Okay, and um, Will, just before I take other people, is this something that you've been working with DMV? Um, I did, yes, I did, um, Dave Evans, I emailed Dave Evans about this and um, he was, he said DMV was supportive of this idea. Okay, so we'll, we'll when we speak to him, we'll, okay, great. Yeah. Um, let's see, Tom and then Martin. Thank you. Thank you, Willa. Uh, um, between, between you and Eric, you certainly uh, 
pointed out that there is a lot, a lot of conditions and requirements that uh, there's still a, uh, a, a number of hoops to jump through, um, you know, for people who end up getting themselves in this position. And, and, uh, and I think, I just think it's important for people to know that it's, it's not um, just a simple, a simple handout, I guess you can say, and, and uh, you know, without even a slap on the wrist type thing. But the thing that you that's got me baffled is the change in it probably happened a number of years ago. I don't know the, the name of uh, crash being changed uh, to IDRP. What, what's IDRP stand for? Um, so, trying <laughs> to bring um, driver rest. You know, I should know this driver restoration program. Well, no, it's not no. though. It's um, intensive. I can Google it quickly, but it, it, right. it, I, I can do it. It's essentially the same program as Project Crash, although I, right. I will say the health department has made changes in recent years, but it is an educational program that includes an assessment and it's for people who get um, convicted or have civil DUI, um, either alcohol and I think drug related offenses as well. Right, Most okay. People, it's alcohol. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Martin. Yeah, yeah Willa. Uh, so with respect to the, uh, the subsection 1A, uh, this concept has satisfied all other reinstatement conditions or requirements. Was it your understanding that that includes still having to have paid the, the court fine uh, or any court fees? Or is that the SR-22, any requirement for project crash? You know, what, what, what was your understanding? My understanding was it was any, every, any, all, everything basically. So that currently in order to get DMV, in order to get your license back, you have to meet a host of requirements and it depends on the individual. So my understanding of the way what Eric drafted would be, you have to meet all your reinstatement requirements, which could be IDRP, it could be just a term suspension that you know your sentence is you can't drive for X right. number of days, or it could be that you pay the judicial bureau something, or your which or your what in, what they call in compliance with the judicial bureau, which means that you have either paid or you're on a, an approved payment plan with the judicial bureau. Okay. So, All right. yeah. So uh, that that's not what my intent was or, I, or what the intent should be. And the reason I say that is that's, that's contrary to what we put into place in four VSA uh, subsection B2A. And essentially what that says is if you haven't paid your fine, the Judicial Bureau is going to contact uh, the DMV and after uh, 20 days to uh, notice period, the commissioner shall suspend the person's operator's license or privilege to operate for a period of 30 days or until the amount due is satisfied. And, and the amount due has to do with fines. What that says to me pretty clearly, and, and I know that's what it was meant to be back then, was that after 30 days, the only thing you need to do to get your license back is to pay the reinstatement fee. Unless, of I, course, there was an SR-22 or anything right. like that. But this provision here would, would completely turn that back from what we, what we intended to do. So I would suggest, and, and you can think further if there, this changes your position on this, my suggestion is making it very clear that the reinstatement conditions and requirements does, includes only those that are required by DMV. Uh, and if that means the, the uh, SR-22, uh, but it doesn't mean the court fines or any fees owed to the court. I, I think that's an important distinction and that um, to clarify my thinking was that you because of the language that you quoted, the 30-day suspension for failure to pay, you are no longer, after that 30-day period, by law, you're not um, suspended, provided you pay your reinstatement fee. Right. Um, so my thinking was what Eric drafted, it did not change that. It would still be that if you fail to pay a ticket, 30 days later, 
um, and it's for a, a violation with points, right. you would be yep. suspended for 30 days and then you're eligible for reinstatement. And to be eligible for reinstatement, you still have to pay the, the fee, the $80 reinstatement fee. But the intention was not to um, contradict that 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 suspension was for only 30 days. Okay, so in, in other words, uh, all other reinstatement conditions and requirements also take, takes into account uh, this section that I just referred to in 4 right. VSA uh, 1109, that if you don't, under that provision, you've done your 30 days, you don't have to pay the fine or court right. fees to, okay, so, so as long as there's that understanding, the language yeah. is probably fine. Uh, but if there's any ambiguity here, we should make right. that clear. And I, so. I, I mean, Dave Evans would probably be the best person to speak to that, but that was certainly not the, not the intent of my suggestion or discussion with Dave and, and Eric. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Well, any, anything else or? The only other thing is I, um, and I'm happy to resend this um, in January. I think it was David Scher shared with the committee a couple of um, stories we had gathered from diversion programs about people's struggles to get their license back. And, and that catalyst for that was the discussion about SR22. But um, the reason I thought of that was um, in there, there are a number of stories that talk about people being able to get a job after they get their driver's license. And I think it was um, Representative Gosselin was questioning, understandably, the, the loss of potential fee revenue to the state if the, if the uh, DMV reinstatement fee is waived. And I think the benefit to the state of having people to um, get a, a job um, would, would outweigh that, that loss. And that's really what comes home to us a lot in the diversion program is how crit, you know, not having a driver's license hampers people's employment. Um, and, and sometimes it's, you know, people being able to get a CDL and getting a really good job or a plumbing, you know, assistant. I mean, we've, I've heard stories where people's lives are turned around dramatically, um, by being able to get a driver's license, plus for all the other reasons of taking your family member to the doctor or, or all the other reasons of wanting to be able to drive legally. So I, I'll just, I'll forward that on to Peggy. Great, thank you, Willa. Yeah, I, I appreciate that because it is very important. And this, you know, we've always looked at this as a really a workforce development um, initiative. Um, Great. Can I Thank ask you. one quick um, follow-up question as well. Yeah. Uh, just quick, and then I want to get to Dale, and we're also yeah. behind. Yeah, yeah no, it's very quick. It's, so you mentioned, uh, Willa, the subsection B one B, the the those pre July first two thousand fourteen. Yeah. Do you want to make clear that they only owe the reinstatement fee because they wouldn't fall under that other provision we were just talking about? Was that what your what suggestion yes. was? That we should make it, um, legit, make it very clear, just reinstatement fee, we're not counting on them doing the thousands of dollars that they still owe or? Yes, my um, suggestion, I, I could follow up in an email given time, but is that those, those people actually, their suspensions be terminated and, their, and the reinstatement fee be waived. Wait, so okay. two, two things for that group of people. Okay, yeah, if you could send an email to Eric, if okay. you could copy me, that'd be great, thanks. Yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you, Willa. Okay, Dave Evans, thank you so much for your, for your patience. Good afternoon. I have to apologize for the, the, the strong backlighting. I could pull my laptop out to log into the meeting and realized my, uh, my battery was dead and the only plug-in I have is with the windows at my back. So I apologize for that. Uh, for the record, Dave Evans, I'm with the Vermont Department of Motor Vehicles. I oversee a number of units, one of which is a driver improvement unit. I'm not hearing you. Is... Can other folks hear him? No, I can't. 
So, so Dave, we we can't hear you. Okay. Um, hang on a second. Let me try something. That worked. That was good. Okay. I'm I'm not sure what I just did, but apparently it worked. Um, the uh, I'm Dave Evans for the record. I'm the uh, work for the Department of Motor Vehicles. I'm uh, the, one of the chiefs over here. I one of the units that I oversee is driver improvement. Um, and um, pleased to be with you this pleased to be here with you this afternoon. Um, are we still having problems with my my voice? Uh, yes and yes and no. Go, why don't you go ahead and <laughs> hopefully we can hear you. Well, hopefully we, it, it'll 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 settle out. Um, my recollection was the same as Representative Alon's. And we started this down this road, um, and it, it's it's changed dramatically. Um, right now uh, in Vermont, um, we have a total of about fifty-two thousand people that are suspended for various reasons. These are all traffic ticket moving violations, um, and um, don't include criminal offenses. Um, of that fifty-two thousand, approximately twenty-five thousand. Our Vermont residents are balanced being out of state people. Um, this bill would directly impact about 8,000 people of that, that uh, 25,000 that are on the list. Um, about uh, 2,300 predate the 2014 portion of this bill and um, the 2,700 roughly um, would be those folks that just have not paid a reinstatement fee. In many cases, they aren't aware that they owe one. Um, I deal with people on a, on a weekly basis where they'll call up and say, well, I paid my, my, my tickets, uh, but I don't understand why my license is still suspended. And you know, you have to pay the reinstatement fee. Um, and so we'd be looking at about a, a, a total of, um, of about 5,000 people. Thank you. I'm not sure if you if you were adding anything else after that, but um, but if not, I know there was a question about um, whether or not DMV can um, can absorb this this loss in terms of its budget. Well, I haven't spoken with our financial people about this, but um, you know, reinstatements um, the um, while they're owed, um, you know, that we don't collect them until they're paid and. Um, you know, in, in, in the majority of these cases, people can't afford to pay, the, pay it. They, they've met their other requirements. Um, but the, the $80 reinstatement fee is, is one that they hadn't anticipated going into this. Um, and, um, you know, I, it, is a, it is a loss of income, but is it income that, uh, that we would be collecting anyway? Um, and I think the answer at best is dubious as to whether we collect it because in many cases, these have hung around for years and years and years. Um, so, you know, I think it's more important, uh, you know, that we get people back able to drive legally uh, to do their business and go back and forth to work. It, it really, uh, the majority of the people that are on this list are people that uh, are in vulnerable situations uh, financially and, and otherwise. Um, and uh, so, you know, if we can, we can assist them in any way uh, to be able to move on with their lives. I think that's, uh, that's an important thing. Thank you. I do see a few hands. Uh, Martin, Tom, Barbara. A uh, quick question, I think, or maybe not. It, what, what about the other, what's the story with the other 17,000 of the 25,000? They have outstanding fines that haven't been paid. Um, you know, the, um, for the most part, that's what it is. These, these are people that have outstanding fines that have gone to collection. Um, you know, without looking at each one, I couldn't tell you exactly. Um, but, you know, anecdotally, I can say that that's what the situation is. But, but if we're trying to say that whether they owe the fines or fees or not doesn't matter, it's just that, you know, if it's been a year, uh, we'll try to figure out their fines and fees some other way, but we want to get their license back. And, and to do that, we're just going to do it automatically and waive the, the, the fee. Does that, you know, the reinstatement fee or, or do we get into the situation in that case where 
you are anticipating collecting the eighty dollars from a lot of those people. Um, the the um, my understanding is we can't do anything about the reinstatement fee as long as these fines and fees uh, to the courts are outstanding, um, and, and that's the situation with with most of the people that are on that that uh, twenty five thousand uh, person list. Okay. All right, so there seems to still be a little bit of misunderstanding that I think what the intention of the Senate was, and, and I was kind of trying to follow the intent of the Senate, except to say that we're not going to forgive the fees and fines, but what we're going to do is reinstate all the driver's licenses uh, that have been suspended for at least a year, uh, because the, the chance of us collecting that $80 is pretty low anyway. Uh, and we'll continue to let the collection agencies or the tax, you know, where we get it through their tax refund, et cetera, to get those fees and fines. But the main thing is we want to, you know, people have been at, suspended at least a year. And as long as it's not like a criminal suspension or a suspension for DUI or any of this, only because they haven't paid their fines, they should get their licenses back. And, and I would like to make this bill make that very clear unless there's a reason why we shouldn't do that. You know, forget about the fines and the incentives and all those things. Is there a reason from DMV's point of view to not read this expansively that if you don't have it suspended for other reason, you know, if you have a suspension because of not paying a fine, it's been at least a year, let's waive the reinstatement fee and, and get those people driving legally. Again. Right. Right. Yeah, absolutely correct. And, and if that is the case, then we're looking at about 25,000 people total. Is there, I, I misunderstood. Yeah, no, it's from your point of view, again, forget about the payment of the fines and fees. That's something we'll take up further with Will, I guess. Is there any reason from DMV's point of view to not do that? No, there is none. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Tom and then Barbara. Thank you. How you doing, Dave? Uh, can you, uh, by any chance, walk me through um, exactly how a and, and what's involved in a license being reinstated? And the reason I'm, I'm saying up front, the reason I'm asking is because to the layperson, it seems like it would be a very, very simple thing to uh, to reinstate a license. Um, I, I mean, I'm thinking go into the you know. Uh, uh, go into a file, change the license from suspended to being good and, and send out a letter of some kind to let the people know. That's, that's a layperson's term. And the reason I'm asking if, if it is that simple, I'm, it's just going through my mind that $80 seems pretty high. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a fair amount to it. What we have to do prior to reinstating someone is to uh, make sure we have compliances uh, and, I, and you were talking about a normal, this, I'm talking about a normal reinstatement, nothing to do with this bill. Uh, let's say we have an individual that's, that's got a suspended license and they call us and say, you know, I, I want to get my, my license problem straightened out and uh, what can you do for me? And the first thing we're going to do is to run their record here in Vermont and find out if there are any outstanding tickets, um, you know, outstanding requirements, for example, from a DWI. Um, we're going to list all of those things on what's called a requirements letter that we then send them saying this is in their bullets all the way down through the page saying these are the things you need to do. You need to contact the Windsor court and pay a court fine and fees there. You need to contact, um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the Rutland court and pay court fees because many times we're dealing with multiple um, uh, offenses that need to be cleared up. Um, if there's a DUI involved, you need a complete IDRP. You need to provide an SR-22. Um, you need to pay a reinstatement fee. Um, and in addition to this, we ran you on the national, uh, the PDPS problem driver point system, and you have two outstanding suspensions in other states, one in New York and one in Wisconsin, um, which we can't do anything for you until you've taken care of these Here's the phone number for you to contact. So it's a long process um, of, but the person that is going through this gets a checklist and, 
and they can actually sit there and check off as they're going down through. I've taken care of this, I've taken care of this, I've taken care of this. And at the end, um, all of the compliances come into us um, from the different agencies and, uh, and the person pays the $80 reinstatement fee and they're reinstated. So, so a DMV employee could have a lot of time involved in one case then? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. At, at, at bare minimum, uh, you know, 15 minutes, 15 to 30 minutes on each one. Bare minimum, yep, okay. And what would be, a, 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 a top of your head, what would be a max on it? I mean, I could foresee uh, a, a day. <laughs> I mean, once, well, if, if through a whole period of time trying to walk somebody through everything, I mean, I, I could see a, a lot of time potentially involved. It, it can in certain circumstances. Those are very few and far between. Um, but, um, you know, a, a long one on for an average clerk um, working on one here in the unit is probably 45 minutes to an hour. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Barbara, Coach, and Martin, and, uh, and then I'd like to, to wrap this up because we are behind on, um, on our expungement uh, discussion. Thank you. Um, so I think my question should be quick. Um, Dave, you mentioned that 52,000 people currently are suspended without licenses and 25,000 are Vermont residents. I'm confused about what happens to the ones that aren't Vermont residents. They have a license in another state. Like I just, that didn't fully register with me what their situation is. That, that's pretty much for the most part correct. They have a license in another state. They're here in Vermont and get involved in some traffic violation or a, you know, a, a, drive, a DUI or an accident, um, something along those lines. And, um, and they don't comply with, uh, with the terms of the, the um, Vermont Civil Citation and take care of it in a timely manner. And we, um, we suspend their right to operate in Vermont and we notify their home state that uh, that we have suspended them for failure to comply with um, with a um, court uh, proceeding. And um, in most cases, the way it's supposed to work, although it doesn't always happen this way, the the home state is supposed to suspend them as well um, until they get this resolved with uh, with Vermont. Um, so that's a that's a huge chunk of the the, the fifty two thousand. It's more than half of the 52,000 are people from out of state that, that owe Vermont um, some fine or something like that. So isn't there sort of the flip side of people in Vermont who got their license suspended in another state? There is, there, we, we have that happen as well. Um, and, and you know, without going through the individual records, we, we wouldn't be able to tell you that number, uh, what that suspension is for. Um, but, um, you know, if they're, they're in a suspension, we certainly would look at it and say, okay, you haven't done anything in Vermont, but you've done something in New Hampshire uh, and send them a requirements letter saying your license is suspended in Vermont. You do, however, need to get this, this thing in New Hampshire straightened out uh, before we can, uh, can reinstate you. And I don't think that this bill pertains to that type of a violation. I, I could be wrong, but. Are, are those numbers embedded, though, in the 25,000 Vermont residents who are suspended? Yes, that, those, those are included in that number. Okay, so depending on the answer to what Martin was saying, that group of people may or may not be affected, right? I mean... Yeah, I, you know, I, I can't really answer that because um, that would just be something that I'd have to run by our attorney yeah. general. Okay. Find out whether we would extend that to uh, to people who committed something out of state. And we don't collect the money. We just say you've got to pay New Hampshire what you owe them or something, right? That's correct. We provide them with a phone number and a contact in New Hampshire where they can uh, can resolve their problem. Okay. So we're, we're we can't and we're not going to waive another state's fee with this bill. Yeah, I don't believe that yeah, we have yeah. the right. to do that. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great, uh, Coach. Uh, thank you. 
Um, I was going to give Tom a very quick um, example of an expiration. Uh, I've got a letter here from the department. <laughs> and uh, if I don't get my uh, uh, DOT physical med card done within 30 days, uh, I will be one of those 25,000 people. <laughs> uh, and you can see, you know, how that could happen, you know, in COVID, trying to get to a doctor that, you know, uh, when every, you know, with all of the social distancing and what have you, it could happen that there is a short lapse in that time. And then, you know, you have to go through the steps, you know, like Dave was saying, and make the call and get down on one knee and say, please help. No, but anyways, that's, uh, those are some of the smaller types of situations. How you doing, Dave? Good. How are you? Good. So, so I just wanted to follow up on Tom's okay. question uh, and Dave's answer to Tom's question. So, so if you if you didn't have to uh, for this reinstatement letter, the checkoff letter, if you didn't have to find all the fines or or court fees that they may or may not owe or that they may owe, if that's not part of it, does that make it more straightforward? Is there a way to say? Here are all the people who are just have fines that that's why they've lost their or had their license suspended. Here are the people who uh, have it suspended because of DUIs or 10 points that they've gotten on their, you know, on their uh, driving license. Um, so is it, would it be easier in that case, or if you don't have to worry about the fines and court fees? Oh, absolutely. It would be well, much, that's much more saying. streamlined. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that and, and so that I think is consistent with what I'm suggesting that we, the end goal here is that fines and fees are out. Of, we don't care about them. We do. The court cares about them. There's other ways they can collect them. It's just wait. It's just getting these driver's licenses back into these people's hands unless they don't unless they have them suspended because of DUI or suspension or other state. Um, all right. Thank you. Okay. Great. Um, okay, I'm not seeing any other hands. I just want to make sure I'm not missing anybody that had the last question. Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody. And uh, as I said, the uh, Senate Judiciary will be will be looking at this, and then we'll uh, we'll get back to uh, the next draft. If sounds like we might need some some clarification, some new language. So, okay. All right, so sorry that we, that I am running behind, but I think that this was helpful to, to have the discussion. Um, okay, in terms of our agenda, I'm gonna wait on H936 as a technical fix um, that we can, we can certainly get to. And, uh, and I'm going to um, move to S294. Um, I think if people need a break, why don't just, um, as, Folks are are doing maybe uh, turn your video off or whatever, and then uh, take a break and come back when you when you can. Uh, so S two ninety four, just to give you some context, that's the larger expungement bill that uh, that passed the Senate and is in our committee. And um, but there are two sections of it, section six and seven, that pertain to the sealing of um, expungement and sealing of criminal records uh, regarding. Um, Marijuana, and those are the two sections that we're going to be looking at. So we are we are not looking at the rest of the expungement bill. Um, we don't have time to do that, um, given COVID and everything else. However, these two sections are very important. They're very important in term, in terms of our work on uh, racial and social justice, and so. Um, I'd like us to move forward um, on those sections. We did, um, if you remember, Bryn gave us a quick walkthrough uh, before we took our recess. Michelle is prepared to give us a walkthrough, but I really wanted to, um, instead of doing the you know, usual walkthrough first and then hear from witnesses, I felt it was really important to hear from our witnesses first to really understand, um, to understand what this means and what this means to have those criminal records um, especially in terms of marijuana and the impact um, on, um, on people of color. So, um, so Michelle is here. If you do have questions while the witnesses are testifying, um, certainly she can answer them. But if not, again, I would like to start with our, with our witnesses. So I want to um, welcome Skylar Nash. 
you hear you're here and uh actually he just texted me that he does, he had to leave i asked him i told him i was going to let him you know that he had to leave okay two, i asked him to jump on so he may okay uh why don't we give him a minute so you're saying he he may jump back on i'm not i yeah i asked him to jump on okay um are you able to could you please text him and and see if he is available um i have been communicating with him and i'm just waiting to hear back from him okay all right well then why don't let's start with laura and uh and laura if we do hear from from skylar i may i may ask you to to yield to him and then come back to you um and i'm totally flexible Okay, great. So, so welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's good to see everyone, even in the virtual format. Um, for the record, I'm Laura Suvin, and I'm the director of the Vermont Coalition to Regulate Marijuana. I also direct the Pennywise Foundation, which partnered with the Vermont Law School Center for Justice Reform, Vermont Legal Aid, and some individual states' attorneys' offices in developing and implementing experiment clinics that operated around the state in 2018 and 2019. And some of those were specifically um, organized for expunging cannabis misdemeanors. Um, so expungement has long been a key goal of the coalition that I represent, which is thousands of individuals and organizations that have been working for cannabis policy reform um, since about 2014. Um, we strongly support the cannabis related uh, provisions of S-294, it, we, we view this as a critical component, component of a movement towards racial justice in cannabis policy, um, and it, that it um, recognizes and aims to repair some of the horrific legacy of racism and the enforcement of cannabis prohibition laws. It's also fair, common sense legislation that will create opportunities and help break cycles of poverty and criminality. Um, so the data is clear that stops and searches for cannabis, cannabis arrests, and subse subsequent convictions in Vermont and across the, the country have dramatically disproportionately impacted Black people and other people of color. Um, we know, for example, that the Vermont police, police stop and ticket Black and Brown Vermonters at a much higher rate than white Vermonters. The Black Vermonters make up only 1% of Vermont's population, but 10% of Vermont's prison population. And that in Burlington, Vermont's largest city, Black residents are arrested at um, more than three and a half times the rate of white residents. And drug-related arrests are specifically one of the four carat categories that make up that disparity. Um, as related specifically to can cannabis, we also know that um, in 2013, the ACLU issued a report that demonstrated that um, Black Vermonters were being arrested uh, as of the year of 2010. Black, arrest Black Vermonters were being arrested at a rate four and a half times that of white Vermonters. Um, this was worse than the national average, and it was much worse in some counties, 9.6 times. The disparity was 9.6 times Black to white arrests in, um, in uh, I'm sorry, in Winds, in Wyndham County, and it was only, almost 17 times the rate in Rutland County. Um, and then, despite both the decriminalization and the legal, legalization of cannabis grown at home, Black Vermonters, ACL issued an updated report demonstrating that um, Black Vermonters continued to be arrested at about six times the rate of white Vermonters. Um, and these disparities persist despite of the fact that use rates in, in, the, in the two populations are, are, are consistently very similar, almost exactly the same. Um, I'm sorry, Laura, so I do see that Skylar um, <laughs> just, did just join and I know he, he needs to leave at, at two, so I wanna just make sure to get him in and, um, and then we'll get back to you. Okay. So thank you, I really, I really appreciate it, Laura. Okay. Great, thank you. Sorry about that. No, no, no. It's so great to see you. And I know you have to go at, at two. And, and if you don't get to finish today, then hopefully you can join us um, on Friday or if not another time. But, but yeah. great. Thank you. Oh, thank you for having me. Um, sure. 
I'll just say good afternoon and thank you again for having me. Uh, for the record, Skylar Nash, a student activist uh, with the University of Vermont. Uh, and for the first time ever, I've actually written my testimony today, just when I wanted to make sure I got to all my points, so I should be brief. Um, so I just have to say that first, uh, I'm incredibly encouraged to see the increased appetite around uh, expanding expungement on both sides, or sometimes, as we know in the state house, all three sides of the aisle uh, that are involved in these decisions. Uh, and, and the appetite to continue to limit the lasting harm traditionally associated with criminal record, um, with a criminal record by expanding the list of expungible uh, criminal charges. Too often, as we move towards uh, improving our justice system, we do so with an exclusively forward-looking lens. What we continue to learn is that to truly and meaningfully reform our criminal justice system, we have to keep an eye to the past and complete that full circle of restitution by both eliminating the harm going forward, as well as mitigating the harm attached to the past. Uh, the expunging and sealing of criminal records are one of the most valuable tools in our disposal when it comes to righting the injustices perpetuated by antiquated and unduly punitive policies. Now, when I testified about the expungement bill last year uh, in Senate Judiciary, I applauded the committee for taking an important step forward, and I do so uh, here today as well in the House. It is, however, concerning to me that there are many people in the community who feel like this enthusiasm around the expungements of marijuana charges specifically is being used to placate those in the community who are wholly dissatisfied with the focus or lack thereof on racial justice and the efforts to pass taxation legislation. Racial and social justice are not issues to visit on the back end, particularly on the issue of marijuana use. I also look at this effort being centered around the automatic expungements of marijuana charges, and while I'm encouraged by that, it brings up broader questions for me. Why, if we decide that any other criminal charge is eligible for expungement, why would we create arbitrary um, barriers to this process? Why are we not expanding our conversation on automatic expungements beyond marijuana? How much longer are we willing to let low-income Vermonters wait before they gain full and unfettered access to this life-changing tool? Vermont Legal Aid, the Attorney General, and the Chittenden County State's Attorney's Office, as I'm sure many other people, have gone above and beyond to host expungement clinics to help lower this barrier for thousands of Vermonters. But I'm sure even they would tell you so many more will fall through the cracks. Often, even if people are eligible to obtain expungement, they may not even be aware of its availability. If they are aware, they almost certainly, in the case of low-income Vermonters, have neither the time nor the necessary resources to navigate the process. If you have been relegated to working multiple part-time jobs to make ends meet as a result of your criminal record, will you have the time to take off from work and attend, and attend an expungement clinic? Now, here we are, seven months later in the midst of a global pandemic and what is sure to be record unemployment numbers, this work is more important than ever. With tens of thousands of Vermonters set to struggle with unemployment in the aftermath of the COVID-19 crisis, it is going to be a monumental struggle for so many of us to get back on our feet and find steady employment. What chance does that leave a Vermonter who is going to attempt to navigate that minefield saddled with a criminal record? Research nationally has shown that time and time again, only a fraction of the people who are eligible to receive an expungement ever apply, effectively keeping them trapped in an often inescapable life of poverty. Unable to gain access to affordable housing, a stable job, thousands of Vermonters are saddled to this lifetime sentence of poverty. A study conducted by the University of Michigan Law School found that people in the state who were eligible to obtain an expungement of their criminal record only did so six and a half percent of the time. There are a number of factors that play into this and unsurprisingly, many of them are economic. No one should have the opportunity to expunge their record withheld because of an inability to pay the associated charges with their criminal charge. We have more than enough data to show it that our continued criminalization of poverty has done in many cases irreparable harm to multiple generations of families. Now, oftentimes, opponents of criminal justice reform measures cite public safety as a reason for allowing our justice system to remain as is. The same Michigan law study uh, also found that people who obtained an expungement of their criminal record had lower criminal behavior in comparison to the general population. It is no surprise that the expungement expansion similar to sentencing reform and other criminal justice reform policies do not have any negative effect on public safety. If anything, a lack of sufficient use of expungement could have the opposite effect and force people to revert to petty crime as a means of survival. What we do know about public safety is that increased economic and educational opportunities lower crime. The study also found that within one year of expungement, Michigan residents saw their potential salary earnings increase by over 22% when compared to their salary projections preceding their expungement. 
The data is clear, the more expungements we grant and the faster, the better the outcomes for residents and therefore the surrounding communities. Last year, Pennsylvania became the first state to move to an automatic expungement system. They saw a massive increase in expungement of records and lower government costs by removing the unnecessary bureaucracy surrounding their expungement process. California, Utah, and other states are moving towards adoption of their own automatic expungement systems. I hope that Vermont will be next in line. I salute the committee for their work on this bill. We need to continue expanding the list of eligible criminal uh, offenses for expungements, as well as the automatic expungement of marijuana uh, criminal offenses. We need to streamline this process. I think it's particularly important as we move forward with the legislation and subsequent taxation of marijuana as a result of recognition that the war on drugs has failed. We must, we must keep racial and social justice at the forefront of any legalization le legislation, not as a back end attachment. Forget that it is good policy, forget that it is economically practical. It is the moral and just destination for this movement. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, um, Skylar. And I, I do hope that you'll submit your, your testimony, yeah. your written testimony as, as well, if you haven't already. And I, I really do appreciate your points about the need to expand uh, the crimes, um, as well as move to automatic expungement. And I, I, I share that um, as, as a goal. So, so thank you. Um, do you have, do you have time to take questions if there are yeah. any? I, I yeah. want to take your, your time. Okay. Um, questions, anybody? But not I don't see any hands, but I want to make sure that I haven't missed anybody. Get me out of here quick. <laughs> it's, it's really really great to see you. I really appreciate it. and uh, hopefully we'll we'll see you again as we continue this work. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Take care. Great. Take care, Scott. Take care. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. okay. Laura, thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate your your flexibility. Yeah, no problem. Um, and I absolutely agree with, um, with the point Skylar was making about automatic expungement in general. And I do think that um, cannabis is is an issue where let's at least start here around behavior that now is generally is is mostly legal and is widely accepted as not present posing serious public harm threats. So. Um, I was just giving some of the background data, which I know most of this committee is very familiar with, about the um, documented uh, discriminatory practices that have occurred in the name of cannabis prohibition and arrests and um, basically all aspects of the criminal legal system. Um, and I also, and so moving on, I know that you've also heard a lot of testimony um, uh, um, about how criminal convictions, including misdemeanor convictions, have a broad away, array of serious collateral consequences. Um, and just quickly, uh, some of these include public lo loss of access to public housing, lock loss of access to supplemental nutrition assistance and other social service programs, possible loss of student loans, preclusion from participating military, the possibility of children's services becoming involved with a family. And it is, of course, the people that mo most need these services that, that have, the, they have the most to lose from, from, from these policies. Um, people who, with criminal convictions, especially people of color who al are already confronting endemic systemic racism, also face discrimination in areas such as employment, housing, and professional licensing when they have um, even misdemeanor criminal convictions on their records. Uh, anecdotal evidence that was gathered by Vermont Legal Aid during the course of, of the, these expungement clinics that um, we were both talking about indicate that the harms generally associated with collateral consequences of convictions are very real here in Vermont. Um, according to a VLA report on those clin clinics, the most common reasons their clients seek expungement are housing and employment re uh, related issues that arise from having criminal records. And they say that many of their cl clients noted that they'd been denied employment expressly because of their criminal records. Um, I thought it was also important um, that they noted that 50% of their uh, clinic clients had children and that clients have told them that their records impact their children in a myriad of ways. And examples of that range from lost, lost wages to being precluded from coaching or chaperoning events for school age kids. Um, so Legal Aid says that particip 
also says that participants frequently mentioned the stigma associated with their criminal record, stating that psychological distress, the, the psychological distress they experience by having a record that follows them everywhere. So we know that people struggle with the impacts of these convictions um, for decades, and it's a lot of people. Um, according to data from the uh, Vermont Crime Information Center, there were nearly 5,000 cannabis-related convictions between 2007 and 2017. This isn't, that was an average of about 500 people per year. And I'm sorry for those of you that were at the Social Equity Caucus this morning that I didn't I frame that stat properly this morning, but um, it was about 500 people a year for that, that decade, which means if you sort of work backwards from there, there are tens of thousands of Vermonters who carry criminal convictions on their records for, again, behavior that's now mostly legal and widely accepted as not posing a big risk. Um, more and more states around the country are recognizing that expunging cannabis convictions is an essential component of creating cannabis policy that responsibly addresses racial and social justice. Seven of the 10 states that have legalized cannabis also have some type, type of cannabis specific expungement or sealing. Um, Illinois, California, and parts of Colorado provide for the type of automatic expungement that's envisioned in S-294. And a number of states that have decriminalized cannabis are also, but haven't yet legalized are also reforming expungement laws. And um, our big neighbor, New York, ha has um, automatic expungement of cannabis. Um, so I think Vermont should join the leaders and, and adopt this critical policy of reform. And again, um, as uh, Skylar, I think, um, mentioned, automatic expungement is key. And that's one of the important things that um, S-294 would do, um, because many individuals, again, echoing um, the earlier sentiments, especially racial minorities, distrust the criminal legal system. They won't willingly interact with it for many good reasons. Or they may simply not realize that they're eligible for expungement. Um, since there have been historically and until very recently uh, costs associated with expungement, including expunging cannabis um, crimes. Many assume that they couldn't afford the relief even if they were entitled to it. Many people don't have the resources for an attorney to help them navigate these questions. And so that means that even a simple petition process is often um, still too complex to achieve the greater goal of equity um, for those who have these kinds of offenses on their records. Um, once again, these broad concerns were, um, we did find them in, in Vermont when we, held, when we held these clinics. Many expungement clinic participants shared that they were unaware of Vermont's expungement law, their eligibility or the expungement process before the um, extensive targeted outreach for the clinics that is what got them there on those particular days. Application-based systems unfairly place the onus of removing a cannabis offense and all of the associated stigma on the individual rather than on the government which created that stigma and the undue burden of a cr criminal record. Um, S-294 would also decriminalize possession of cannabis in amounts that are slightly above the legal threshold, so up to two ounces and four mature plants. This provision has a clear practical purpose. It will enable the court system to expunge records quickly and cost effectively, as many of the state's low level, can level cannabis convictions did not distinguish between one and two ounces. And making that distinction and expunging them would be a very time consuming and um, cost generating prospect. But it would also protect Vermonters who may inadvertently be in possession of just over the legal limit. Um, and it would pr protect them from arrests and, and other co collateral consequences. And finally, expanding decriminalization slightly is another modest incremental step towards moving cannabis policy toward equity. Um, so we support this, the, the cannabis provisions of this bill and we think that the, now at the time is right for it. We agree that, um, that prioritizing responding to the harms caused by cannabis prohibition has to be the leading motivation in all our efforts to, re to reform cannabis policy. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, just looking, see if any hands are up. 
I don't see any hands. So I just want to make sure I'm not missing anybody. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, David Scher from the Attorney General's Office. Join us, please. Good afternoon. Good to see everybody. David Scher, Assistant Attorney General with the Attorney General's Office. And um, the Attorney General certainly supports the provisions that are being discussed this afternoon in Section 6 and 7. Um, we, I really appreciate the testimony of both Laura Subin and Skylar Nash. They've given an excellent overview of the reasons why these provisions make sense. Uh, they make sense from an economic standpoint, from a socioeconomic equal equity standpoint, and from a racial justice equity standpoint. And I think the data statistics and um, personal experiences that were brought forward and discussed uh, by the prior two witnesses are really compelling. And um, I think they've done as good a job as I could do. And I won't go through all those again, but just to say that we uh, are in agreement with those, that reasoning is uh, important and we should support these provisions. I mean, this committee should support these provisions. The attorney general certainly does. Um, briefly speaking to Skylar Nash's point, it, the attorney general's office has been in favor of an even broader expansion of expungement than is in six, section six and seven. But this is an important step and we should start here. And hopefully we hope to see uh, broader expansions of expungement move forward. Uh, I certainly agree with the automatic expungement for these provisions. Uh, again, as, as changing societal understandings around cannabis use um, would dictate a very smooth, frictionless process for eliminating these convictions from people's records. And we think that's important and an important innovation in this policy, one that, or I should say in this bill, one that uh, Vermont has not previously embraced with respect to the automatic expungements. And, and um, that is something we support. So my testimony is just that, it's brief. I'm happy to go into more detail. I do think the prior witnesses have done a really excellent job and said much of what I would have said, but I don't think I can repeat it any more clearly than they said it, and I will uh, let the committee move forward. But of course, I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, great, thank you. Appreciate that, David. I am, again, I'm not seeing any hands, but I wanna give folks a minute to put their hand up or jump in. Uh, Martin. Yeah, I think this may be a question that comes after we hear from Judge Grierson, but it is possibly for David and, and some of the others is, uh, I know in the past we've had uh, the hang up or hold up we've had is the difficulty in doing automatic expungement going back to the paper records and such. Uh, has there been any thought or work from your side as far as how to uh, help uh, expedite that uh, process, like actually pointing to the individuals who are eligible to, for expungement and such? Because I know we had been talking about the DLS uh, earlier, and there was this idea that the AG's office would come forward with a list of here's all the folks that need to get this relief through this DLS bill. Is that something that uh, the AG's office or others have thought about? I think the DLS issue was a slightly different procedural issue, if I'm remembering correctly, where essentially the concept was that uh, as a way to move that forward as quickly as possible, the AG's office would get a list from either DMV or the judiciary of everybody who qualified and we'd basically submit a blanket motion. And that was more of a procedural uh, problem that we were trying to overcome as efficiently as possible and one that we were certainly happy to participate with. I think the issue here is more just around the pure logistics of running through all the paper records that the judiciary would have. And I do think that the judiciary is gonna be in the best position to answer that. Uh, we understand we're sympathetic to the challenges that are posed by that. Um, and I would defer to the judiciary in terms of how best to approach that. Okay, I don't see any other hands. You might have given us our segue <laughs> to the judiciary. Okay, I don't. Well, great. Well, thank you. Thanks so much, David. Thank you. Okay, so I don't think Bobby Sand is here. Uh, we heard that he had another, uh, has a conflict. So uh, let's move to um, Judge Grierson. 
Uh, good afternoon. Afternoon, welcome. Yes, good to see everyone. Um, Thank you. For the record, Brian Grierson, Chief Superior Judge. And I, I was talking with Eric yesterday, I don't know if it was on this bill or another one, Eric Fitzpatrick, and I was just saying how difficult it is with the three segments of the session to remember, you know, what the testimony and so forth was in, 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 uh, in the previous sessions. I would begin by saying, you know, there isn't anything that um, uh, Skyler or, or David or Laura has testified to that we disagree with from a policy perspective. I mean, this is obviously a laudable effort um, and, and the, the judiciary doesn't, you know, take a position that we're opposed to the policy behind this. But I can tell you that um, in, in testifying before the, um, the Senate, when it was in Senate Judiciary, we took the same position. Um, but there has to be a recognition of um, the fact that it, it, it is a resource issue for the court uh, to be able to do this. Um, and that I think was uh, reflected in the Senate Judiciary's um, approval of this language that at that time uh, carried a, I want to say, a, um, a fiscal impact memo that I provided to the committee earlier this afternoon, but it's also one that was supplied last February to uh, to Senator Sears and yourself, um, Chair Grad, uh, Senator Kitchell and, and um, Representative Toll. Um, and it encompassed a number of bills involving expungement, including this one. Um, and the total uh, uh, requested appropriation to be able to accomplish this that was in the neighborhood of a million dollars. Um, the Senate Judiciary uh, did acknowledge that, but when the bill went to the, and, I, and I'm just going by memory, I, I certainly don't know the details of what happened when it went to the Senate floor, but my recollection is that that, that uh, appropriation uh, was removed. Um, so I don't know what, I don't really know what the status is, but in, in that respect, um, the judiciary's memo that was provided um, still reflects uh, the reality of, of of this process. Um, and I would add to that that there's really nothing at this point about automatic about this process, um, at least from the perspective of what work has to be done in order to um, expunge uh, these records. If by expungement we mean destruction of the actual records. Um, and as Representative Lalonde indicated, we've talked about this issue a number of times that um, these records that need to be expunged are paper records. Uh, in other words, they predate the introduction of our uh, new case management system. So for the most part, everything we're talking about are, are paper records. Some of those records uh, probably still remain, the physical records remain in the courthouses, although probably very limited. Uh, many of them are in storage. Uh, I think the primary storage, if not the only one, is perhaps in Middlesex. And some of them are going to be so old that they, they, um, they include uh, microfiche, microfilm, uh, where these records are kept. Um, and so th there's a process um, that uh, Terry Scott will be testifying after me, and I think she can give you more detail about the actual process of what's involved in doing that. But uh, suffice to say that there is a, um, a price tag attached uh, to this process. And clearly a couple of things have changed uh, with the um, advent of, of um, COVID-19, um, not the least of which is if you recall, the bill was S-114. I, I, Excuse me, I don't remember what the act number was, but uh, uh, that was a, uh, one of the emergency bills that was passed that included a provision, um, among others, that said um, the timelines for uh, expungement and sealing uh, were suspended for it's 120 days after AO 49, uh, the, the Supreme Court's AO Administrative Order 49 expired. Right now, that's been extended to, um, I believe, the end of this year. 
Um, and depending on what happens between now and the end of the year, I, I cannot tell you that it won't be extended beyond that. But suffice to say, at this point, it's, it goes to the end of the year. Um, and under that, uh, that bill, that act, um, expungement processes are suspended for 120 days after the end of that bill. I'd also need to remind the, the committee and one of the difficulties in this um, is the provision that was passed, I wanna say it was either last year or two years before that reflected the fact that oftentimes a, a simple marijuana possession, the, the type of offense that is being uh, eligible for expungement here may in fact be one count in a two or three count information. And uh, those, all of those offenses may not be eligible for expungement. And the statute that the legislature passed um, since 7606, Title 13, 7606, um, says until all charges, this is until all charges on a docket are expunged, the case files shall remain publicly accessible. Um, and that's true of sealing. So in other words, um, what it requires is not only gaining access to the old files, but many of those old charges, if they are part of a multiple count um, information, may not be eligible uh, for expungement under the current legislation. Um, so I, I, I certainly want the committee to understand from the judiciary's perspective that we don't question the, the merit uh, behind the policy, um, but there has to be a recognition that it's not saying it's automatic, um, doesn't necessarily make it automatic in terms of what is required under even under this bill. It requires not only going back to locate the records, but giving notice to all of the entities um, with, that are identified as having access to this record, the law enforcement, state's attorney, VCIC, uh, even the respondents. Um, and I know some of the witnesses said, for instance, that the respondents um, sometimes don't e are not even aware of the ability to have their record expunged. Um, by the same token, we don't, we're not going to have to go back very far before the notices that we send to these folks are going to come back to us because we don't have valid addresses for them. Um, but it's still part of the process. So if you look at the bill from the work perspective, there's a, there's a fair amount of work that, that has to be done. And, and I think, it, you know, as I listened to the testimony today, I, I have not read the, for instance, the Pennsylvania bill uh, in detail, but well, follow up, looking at Google um, and, to see what was listed under the Pennsylvania expungement bill. And I'll just give you one example. This is an uh, article out of the Philadelphia Inquirer. Um, it says they're talking about sealing of records. It's not an expungement bill. They seal the records, which is different obviously than expungement. The, the statement says the state had previously allowed certain criminal records to be expunged or erased after a waiting period. The new law includes a wider range of offenses, but instead of expunging, merely seals them. And that means the records will still be uh, visible to law enforcement and can still show up on background checks and so forth. So again, I have not read the bill, um, but to say that it's automatic and they're expunged, apparently uh, what they do is seal the records. Um, and so they're not completely uh, lost to law enforcement and other, other entities that the legislature would define who would have access to a sealing of a record. So I, I can't say, and, and Terry can speak to this uh, in more detail than I can, I can't say that the work involved in expunging versus sealing uh, there's a difference, but I don't know that it's a substantial difference. It's still going to carry um, 
a certain uh, price tag even to do that. But I, with the committee considering this bill, I just don't want there to be a misunderstanding of what automatic means. Um, it, it's truly not automatic. There's a lot of work involved mm -hmm. in doing this. And some folks who have those convictions under the current law would not get them expunged if they're part of a multi-count information. The reason I bring that up is oftentimes that's what happens. Someone is stopped because of a taillight out, uh, which leads to suspicion of marijuana. Um, and and I, I certainly have seen and read the evidence to suggest that uh, people of color are, are more susceptible to these offenses, uh, being charged with these offenses, but then it leads to uh, perhaps a license uh, being suspended or some other offense so that it ends up with a multi-count uh, information, not all of which uh, is available for expungement or at least expungement without a petition being filed. Um, that, that's, you know, a quick, quick summary, if you will, an overview of, of our view of, of this bill. Um, we didn't oppose it in Senate Judiciary, but it certainly made Senate Judiciary aware of the same issues I'm talking to you about now. Um, and I don't know what happened when it went to the floor of the Senate, um, but certainly coming out of Senate Judiciary, there's recognition that there was a significant um, uh, resource issue and fiscal impact in doing what they wanted to do. Thank you. Um, thank you, Your Honor. I, I do have a question about that, though. Um, I'm looking at the memo, and, and um, it does involve uh, four bills. And, um, and this um, S-294, we're only looking at two sections of it. So I'm wondering, in terms of, are you able to say that million dollars, how much of that um, is attributable to, to this bill? Or, is, does, or is, was that for all of those bills? It's certainly the memo related to all those bills. I can't tell you today how much of it would um, relate to this, the two provisions of this bill, other than to say um, that this bill, it, it almost goes back forever. In other words, it, it would be a, still a significant part of, of that. I, I can, I would have to go back through the other bills to see uh, what number one, what happened to them, but what what they involved. But this this was significant in part because of the there's really no time limit um, on how far back we have to go. Um, so I think it would be significant. I cannot obviously I can't tell you that it the full million, but it, it was significant. Thank you, uh, Barbara. Thanks. Hi, Judge Gerson. Great to see you. Good to it's, see you too, Representative. It seems like it's been forever. Um, so, so I'm wondering, it looks like a lot of states are doing automatic expungement now or municipalities. And we were just hearing too about DMV and how long it's taking them per case to spend on um, clearing the records on their end. So again, I'm wondering if we were, to, when you talk about the cost of doing this, I'm thinking about the cost of not doing it. And what does that mean in terms of societal cost of somebody not getting a job or not getting their federal um, grant to attend college? So I, I guess I, I, it sounds like you're, you're in agreement with the policy and it's sort of up to the legislature to figure out how do, how do we help government to sort of catch up with this effort. And now that California and huge states are doing it, you know, what, how did they accomplish it? And can we make it easier on our governmental agencies to to do what we know is the right thing to do? I'm not sure I can answer <laughs> that question 
completely, but I, I'll start by saying, again, because of, of the of policy nature of this bill, we neither take a position in favor or oppose it, but we certainly respect the policy and understand it. Um, but you're right. When you talk about uh, the balance of the benefit to society as a whole, if people can get reemployed, that's really a decision for the legislature to make. You have to make that, you have to do the balancing and say, yes, we know that this is going to be expensive to do. This is a system that was uh, created by the legislature um, that we maintain these records. Uh, there are any number of rules and regulations that require us to maintain these records over the years. And now we're being asked uh, to remove or expunge them. And so, I, I agree with you that there is a balancing of the benefit to society, uh, it, but there's a cost involved. And it's only the legislature that can say, we believe as a legislature that we recognize there's a cost involved in doing this work and there's a greater benefit if we invest that money um, to, to have, have these obstacles removed. Um, right. That's, that's the best answer I can give. And I thought this week in particular, just looking at expungement, um, and maybe this is, I don't mean to make this political, but it just sort of struck me that um, the, and I don't remember which of Trump's sons raised the issue of um, the police shooting in Kenosha, that the person had a police, but he had a, prior police record. And again, I just think about how um, the stigma and bias as a society that we place on that kind of information, whether it was true or, or not. Um, but I feel like it keeps coming up and being used against people and either, and again, I realize it's not something that you're gonna take a position on, but either we have faith that the, that people can change or why are we, if we're just branding them for life, why are we bothering to, it just feels like we have conflicting things going on, I guess. No question, we have conflicting <laughs> issues going on. Not I, you I would, say, I, not you I would I. <laughs> say two things by way of clarification. I think we have to be careful in using the term expungement when I think what most of these states are really doing are sealing and, and Representative Lalonde knows that in the, the uh, sentencing commission discussions that I, that I have attempted to bring up, uh, and it's not an issue for today with respect to this bill, but this idea of sealing and then expungement, we don't really need this two-step process. And the Pennsylvania bill, at least for what I'm reading on Google, and I'll get back to Google in a minute, um, indicates that what has been referred to as an automatic expungement is really a ceiling that allows for, continues to allow for access for certain entities, which I think is a, an important difference um, in, in the two. But at the same time, um, when we're talking about what protection and the, the, the benefit, you have to ask yourselves, is there a, a benefit to having a two-step process um, versus simply ceiling? And then I'll go back to this point, and I don't know where whichever Trump son it was got his information, but whether it's expunged or sealed, society now allows me to Google uh, in, in a matter of minutes while your witness was testifying to find out what was written about this, uh, the Pennsylvania expungement law. And I'm assuming that if I put uh, somebody's name in Google, I could find out if they had a, a criminal record and the information in that Google entry may be completely uh, wrong. And whether it's been expunged or sealed or not, it's out there. Right. And, uh, and it's, it's, it, it's a, how can I put this? When I started on the bench, getting anything expunged was almost impossible. It was extremely rare. Um, and we've come a long ways, and this is another step in that process. But as we expand the, the, the offenses and the time frame involved in doing that, it does come with an attendant um, 
cost to be able to to do that work and, and clear these records. Um, right. I'm I'm not trying to come in as the doomsayer here. I'm just saying this has to be a recognition uh, of of what's involved in doing doing this process. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else for Judge Gerson before we finish up with Terry? We are at time, but I think if we could just hear from Terry, that would be helpful. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I just had to remember to unmute. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I think the, the term automatic, uh, what I do want to recognize is that um, the term automatic, <clears throat> which I think um, people think of as the, the defendants, the, the people who, who carry the records, don't have to petition the court, that they don't have to, um, you know, as um, the, the first young man spoke about, um, they don't have to come um, forward, you know, to work to get that done, that there would be a time element, and then the court would take care of it. Um, you know, we right now for, for the cases, uh, for the marijuana cases, uh, right now they go back uh, probably into when our case management system first started keeping records. Um, and there are records prior to that that were handwritten records that are on the old um, microfilm. Uh, microfilm ended in 2007. And those are the difficult ones because, um, and it would be great at some point to talk to um, to uh, Tanya Marshall at, at Public Records uh, at, at Vicera, um, because those, they're not able to scratch off anymore. And so, you know, a new index will, will need to be kept there uh, to ensure that nobody can access those uh, because they, they just can't get them off the microfilm at this point. Um, and again, you know, uh, just to talk a little bit about the process, uh, it is like not unlike the DMV, it's about a 20, uh, you know, over time, over a few days, you know, per case, we would, we, we figured out it's about a 20 to 25 minute process. By the time you create your cert certification, your, your letters, you're uh, getting information out to all of the, uh, the parties, you know, the state's attorneys and making sure the respondent um, gets notice, um, but as we've seen, you know, we would get a lot of those letters back because ad the addresses we have from those older cases um, uh, would would mostly not be available. Um, I think right now I, I've been trying to work uh, efficiently with my um, RIS department and uh, get some information. Um, there's a lot of cases out there. They go, you know, they go back to, like I said, uh, that we can find on our system that started in 1991. Uh, but I would uh, be happy to provide you with some numbers as soon as I get them in. And that would just be for the convictions. There were multiple, multiple charges that over time, many people attended diversion programs and also um, um, had dismissals by the state. Um, but again, if those were a, uh, a piece of a multi-count charge, as Judge Grierson noted, 7606, um, you know, those do remain available on the paper file. They would be removed from our case management system. Um, you know, so if you're just looking at a docket sheet only, there would be that blank charge number. But in the file, if somebody chooses to look at a file, they would be able to find that that charge was there. So if there are other questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate your, your testimony. I'm um, again looking for hands. Uh, don't see anybody at, at this point. Judge Gerson, did you wanna add something? I, I think you're muted still. I just, uh, something Terry mentioned um, reminded me of something I wanted to bring up my testimony. And that is because of the change brought about by COVID-19 and the AO49, that whatever the legislature does with this bill, we, we could not, uh, I can't imagine we can comply with a July 2021 20, uh, date for all the reasons I testified to before. Right. Um, and if the committee wants, um, 
we can try to clarify uh, the fiscal impact um, as it relates to this particular bill. Um, Thank you. We can, look, we can look into that further. Yeah, um, I think the resource issue will still remain, you know, that we will need uh, the folks to do this because the numbers will be so extreme. And along those same lines, it, it really needs to be part of this fiscal year because even if we're our, our work is delayed as a result of AO49, we still need to go through the recruitment and training process so that if it begins on, let's say, April 1st, we have the staff available to do that work, even if the timeline is extended. So um, thank you. Great, great, thank you. And, and it would be helpful to, to look at just the impact of the fiscal impact of these two sections, as opposed to the, all the four bills. Great, okay, thank you. I just see that Bobby Sand joined in and we're, Bobby, I'm sorry, but we actually need to adjourn, but this is, this is not the only day we're gonna be doing this. So, anyway, so thank you. Um, okay, we're- Being late. Great, okay. So committee witnesses, Michelle, I know we didn't, we didn't get to you, but we are 10 minutes over and I didn't give us a break. So I, I do wanna adjourn, but we will um, get back to this on, on Friday. Um, members, committee members, if you have questions, other folks that you would uh, like to hear from on expungement, cannabis expungement, please, please do let me know. Um, Michelle, before we adjourn, did you, did you have anything that you wanted to say? Uh, no. Okay, <laughs> great. I just saw you, saw you come on, so I just wanted to, to make sure. Okay, great. Uh, Tom, I see your hand is up. Yeah, I was just wondering, on the agenda, it just says uh, to be announced, but um, will that be a 10.30 to 12.30 on Friday? The times are there, but I just wanted to make sure that those will be the times just for planning work and that type of thing. So it will, it does change next week. Uh, Catherine just uh, finalized it, so I'll get that out to folks. Um, but um, I am hoping that maybe we could lock in our times next week and that those will be the times going on so we don't do have to do a week by week. No, I was just what I was just wondering about Friday. Yeah, no, yeah, this is it on Friday. Yeah, the reason why I um, I wasn't sure how far we would get today and, and who else right. we would need. So, yes, okay, so that we'll, is... we'll plan on 1030 to 1230 Friday. Right. Okay, great. Thank you. Great. Okay, anybody else? Okay. Well, why don't we go off, uh, let's adjourn and go off YouTube.